What a great crowd. Happy Father's Day to everybody. If you're a dad, we're so glad you're with us. Everybody have a seat real quick, if you will. We're going to dive in here for a second. I want to begin by just saying some of you showed up and you're like, whoa, I didn't know Pastor Mike had another brother. How come he doesn't wear a soul patch like him, you know? It's funny, I actually had uh, his mother come up to me after service last night. She's like, I, I came to church and thought, I thought Mike was on sabbatical and he's here tonight. So uh, we're good friends. We've been friends for a long time and it's truly an honor to be back at Inspire Church. It's so exciting to see what God is doing. And if you're a dad, you know, let me just say a couple things about the father of the house. And that is Pastor Mike. And how many know that you are blessed to have some of the greatest pastors, Pastor Mike and Pastor Lisa, on the planet? You really are. One of the things I love about Pastor Mike is that he is the guy. This is the thing that his friends say about him when he knows he's not around. One of the things they'll say about him is this. Hey, if you need to talk to somebody who's not going to settle, who's not just going to go for a base hit but wants to swing for the fences, you need to get around Pastor Mike Kai. How many would say amen to that? He's a man of faith. He's going to go for it. He's going to do everything in his power to, to leave, leave nothing on the table. I was thinking about it, and uh, I also realized that Pastor Mike is a little bit competitive. How many say amen to that? A little bit competitive. I played golf with him recently, and uh, I'm telling you it's true. He is very competitive. Uh, in fact, it made me think of a story several years ago when he came to Higher Vision Church. And let me just say, if you're ever in the L.A. area, come check us out. Be with us. Go to Magic Mountain and then come and be at God's Mountain on the other side. And uh, so he was there speaking at Higher Vision. And uh, we'd gone out to, it was the, the day before services, so we'd gone out to a movie, had dinner. I had some of my kids with me. I have four grain, grown children. In fact, I don't know if you guys have the, the, the picture, but I thought I'd throw it up today since it is Father's Day. And I'm not with my kids. I wanted to show you my kids. And uh, on the left is my um, daughter, Haley. She's on staff and oversees our experience and our uh, culture as a pastor. The, the one next to her is Macy. She's our worship and creative pastor. That's my wife, Devette. We've been married for 30, almost 33 years now. And then my granddaughter in her arms is Kailani. And then my grandson right there, Arbor. By the way, I don't know if you know, I started a, uh, a, um, a modeling agency and it's going very well. I just signed my first talent. He's right there on my lap. Not really. I don't have a modeling agency, but how many think he'd do a good job as a model right there? He's a handsome guy. That, that's Arbor. And then uh, next to him is my son Hudson, my daughter-in-law Leilani, and my son Tanner. And I'll never forget that, uh, um, thank you, three of you like my family. The rest of you are not quite sure. You're like, oh, okay. Well, I'm checking them out. We'll see, we'll see what they like. I don't know. Um, I was thinking about it when Pastor Mike was over um, and uh, we were coming back from the movie and from dinner and we were walking to the hotel and as we're walking at that time my son Tanner he was probably about 16 or 17 and we're walking along and suddenly Mike looks at Tanner and he's like Pastor Mike and he's like yo bro you think you're fast? <laughs> Becky you know what I'm talking about the competitive and, and, and my son Tanner's like yeah I'm fast he's like bro you want to race? Mike at this time is what, a 47-year-old man? And he's like, I'll take you on, bro. Come on right now. So here's what they do. They line up, and they're going to race to the, the hotel. So they line up, and I'm just standing there like going, what, are you going to pull a hamstring, and then you're not going to be able to preach tomorrow. He's like, I got it, bro. I got it. And so he lines up like this, and he goes. He's like, ready, set, and boom, he takes off. And man, they are jamming, and Tanner dusts him. But anyway, he tried. He made an effort. Because he's competitive. Some of you are like, why'd you tell that story? Well, the reason I told the story is, did you know that if you're a dad, even if you're a mom, maybe you're a student, maybe you're a grandparent, whatever you are in life, how many know that we're all in a race? In fact, let me read a cool verse to you. It's found in Hebrews, and here's what it says. It says, Hebrews 12, 1, says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Come on, do this. Do this with me. Look at your neighbor and say you're in a race. Now look at your second choice and tell them too, okay? Tell them. Say, you're in a race. And I want to throw something out. If you're a parent, if you're a dad, 
today, your job is not only to finish the race, but to equip your kids to run their race. And so today, what I want to do is, you know, we're kind of in this season where racing is on, on our minds. If I'm into the Olympics. Right now, the Olympic trials have started for swimming, and they're going to have track and field. And so I want to talk to you on a theme, and I'm going to take an interesting twist. We're going to go to the book of Esther. If you have a Bible, go with me there. And all of you that are joining us online, jump to the book of Esther. If you don't know the book of Esther, it's about this, basically, child that grows into a woman. She becomes the queen of the nation. She's a Jew, but doesn't tell the king that she's a Jew. And what ends up happening is she saves her people when the enemy tries to take them out. Her name is Esther. And when we read this story, we often focus on her. But today I want to take a minute and I want to focus on the other main character in the story. And his name is Mordecai. And guess what he was? A father. And I want to take some of this story from the book of Esther, and I want to focus on how this father got his daughter ready for the race. Just like Pastor Mike said to my son, today we're going to talk about this race, and I've entitled the message, Ready, Set, Go. In fact, I think you'll figure out my three points today. Point number one is, if you, if you look at the screen, you'll figure it out. Point number one is what? Ready. Point number two is what? Point number three is what? Let's try it one more time. Come on, all the way. What's the first point? Next point? Next point? Ready, set, go. And when you look at the story of Esther, you begin to see it. Let me show you the father in the book of Esther. Esther chapter 2, verse 7 says this. Mordecai had brought up Hadessa, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. She was an orphan. The young woman was lovely and beautiful, and when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his daughter. This is a book about a father, not just a daughter. And so today, I want to do this. I want to talk to you on this theme, Ready, Set, Go. But I want to begin with this. I want all the dads in the house. If you are a father, I would like for you to stand to your feet. All the dads stand. Come on, can we give it up for all our dads? Come on, Dad. We're proud of you. Now, I want to do this today. I want to pray a prayer, and we're going to pray for a blessing on all the dads. But I also, at the end of that prayer, I want to pray for all the people today that this is a tough day. Because maybe you've lost a dad like me. Or maybe you never really had a dad. Maybe you're here and you are a dad, but it's been a struggle. Maybe you wanted to be a dad, but you never were able to. Today, I want to pray a prayer for you as well. Can I tell you something? Dads, look at me, every one of you. God gets you. He gets you. You know why? He called himself a father. I am the father of Abraham. I am the father of Jacob. He's a dad. And the Bible says he takes the lonely, just like Esther, and he puts them in families, and he becomes their father. So today, God gets you. And I want to bless you with this prayer. Everybody stretch your hand towards these dads. Father, first of all, we pray for every dad and we pray for blessing. Lord, for the ones that are discouraged and want to give up, fill them with strength. For the ones, Lord, that have challenges that they don't know how to face those challenges, give them strength. Give them wisdom. God, let this day be a day not where they feel, feel beat down or feel less than or feel like they wish they could do more. Instead, let them leave empowered and filled that, Lord, you have more, that you can do great things in and through them. And, Lord, we also pray for all of those that today has been a tough day, a challenging day. Step in and be our Father. Bring your peace and your comfort on this wonderful Father's Day. And if you believe that, if you stand with me on that, come on, somebody shout, amen. Amen. Come on, give it up to our dads one more time. Amen. You can be seated. So when I read through this story, thank you very much. When I read through this story, I, I begin to see some things, and I saw three principles. The first principle is point number one, and I think you know it already. Point number one is what? Ready. ready. Just like a race, if you, I believe they have a picture. When you get ready to run a race, what happens? They basically say, and it can be said different ways. One is on your mark or get ready. 
And what does that mean? It means that all the racers are going to go to their spot, their lane, and get next to the little yellow or the, the little line that is their starting point for the race. And when you read the book of Esther, I read this part after he becomes Esther's uh, father, Mordecai. Look what it says in Esther uh, chapter 2, verse 10. It says, Esther had not revealed her people or family. In other words, she didn't tell the king that she was a Jew. Here's why. For Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. You see, what I see when I read that is that Mordecai sat his daughter down and he said, listen, I want to help you get in position to prepare you for what might come in the future. There's going to be a lane that you're going to run in. There's going to be some obstacles that you might have to run over. Here's the question, Dad. Let me, let me do this to encourage you as a father for the days ahead. Are you getting your children in position to run their race to win? Maybe you're not a dad, but here's the question for you. Have you allowed your father to sit you down and get you in position so you're ready to run the race to win the prize? That's part of the journey. Get ready. He pre- Think about it. He prepared her for her moment. Can I tell you, the Bible gives us some truth about parenting. You could be a mom, a single mom here, and this is true for you as well. Maybe you're here and you don't have kids, but you're a spiritual mentor, a spiritual father to someone, a spiritual mother to someone. I want you to see what the scripture tells us about this stewarding of the people that he's placed in our lives. It's found in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, and it says this. It says, start children off on the way they should go, and when they were old, they will not turn from it. What does that say? It means get them to the starting blocks, get them at the position that they need to be in so that they can run in their lane and they can win the prize. Prepare your kids for the race that's before them. I'll give you a little story about how that as a dad, you know, I don't have every win. I've had some challenges. One of my children has had a challenging um, many years and is a prodigal and has kind of found their way back to faith. So we haven't been perfect, but we have seen God do some good things. And I'm going to tell you one of the successes in our story. How many of you here have, have, some, have some challenging moments in your life as a parent? How many realize you didn't know what you were getting into when you became a parent? I mean, ever, sometimes you, you didn't really say it out loud. You're like, can we do this over again? Okay. So um, we did have a success. Let me tell you one of our successes. So my son Tanner, all of my kids are very talented. They uh, play instruments. We used to, in fact, they had a, a band that used to travel. We used to t- um, tour and open for uh, Christian groups and secular groups. And uh, um, so... My son, when he was a freshman, they, they were in a school that had this really amazing jazz program. And um, normally, you know, in school choir, it's like 95 girls and two guys. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But this program, they had a lot of guys in there, people that wanted to get into the music industry, you know, were close to L.A. and Hollywood. And so this jazz program was really good. And when, when he started, I realized something. I realized that my kids were going to graduate and want to go to college, and I'm a minister and that is, ex- how many know that college is expensive? And so I'm thinking, oh no, how are they going to pay for their education? Because I'm not independently wealthy. I'm in ministry. And, and so I started thinking, how can I prepare my kids to be in a position, to get in a position on the starting line so that they can fulfill their dreams and run the race? So when I was thinking about him, it, it hit me because I had a music degree. I used to be a worship pastor. And, and so I told my son something one day his freshman year. I'm like, son, you're starting jazz choir. And I'm going to tell you something. If you'll apply yourself, and as a, a male especially, if you'll learn how to um, scat and improvise, there's not a lot of guys that can do that. And there's programs out there where you can get scholarships to, to go to school for your music. So I said, so I'm going to make sure you know how to to scat. Now, some of you are like, what is scatting? Well, scatting is like when you're playing jazz music and the guy stands up or a gal stands up and they're kind of like, ba-da-ba-doo, ba-da-ba-da. Anybody ever heard him getting to do that kind of thing? Ba-da-ba-doo-da-doo-ba-doo-day. That kind of stuff. They'll scat, they'll improvise, kind of like when someone does a solo on a guitar. So I look at him, I said, son, you're going to learn how to scat. And he's like, I don't want to. 
And so you're going to learn how to scat. So literally, this is no joke, on the way to school, I would turn on jazz music, and I would get to the parts of the, where it kind of would like, just the, the music was playing, and I would start to scat. i say, son, this is how it works. And I would start scatting. Ba-da, ba-do-do-da, ba-do-da-da. And I'd, I'd start doing it. i said, now you try it. And he'd be like, I don't want to. <laughs> and I'm like, well, guess what? If you don't do it, you won't get your phone after school. <laughs> it's amazing how motivated they can be. Ba-da, ba-da, da 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 can I, can I dance too, Dad? I mean, he was like, and so, because the thing is, when you scat, you don't know what you're going to sing. You're kind of riffing, and so you can hit bad notes, and so people are scared to do it, and that's one of the biggest things that stop them from being able to develop the talent. So I worked in with him, and I worked, and you're not kidding me, I'm not kidding you, on the way to school, almost every day, I was making him scat, and he got better, and he got better, and let me just tell you, by the end of his senior year, he'd gotten so good, in fact, his jazz program had won the national competition in Monterey for a jazz competition, and he started getting recruited by schools and there's this one school that was in um, Florida called Miami University Frost School of Music which is the number one jazz program in the world and every year they offer one full ride talent scholarship to one student he didn't get it but uh, no I, I'm lying I'm lying that's not true they fly him in why because and then they had lots of females but he was kind of an anomaly a guy that was really good at scatting. And so they brought him in, they did the full treatment, blue chip, you know, offered him almost a $300,000 scholarship that I won. No, no, I didn't. (laughs) He won because one of my good moments as a parent, I got him to the starting line and I prepared him for the race. You know what he did? He turned it down. And he went to a Christian school. And when he went to a Christian school, when they found out the level of what he was offered, they changed their whole financial structure and scholarship program and matched the scholarship that he got. And he got to do it in a Christian school. Come on, isn't God good? To me like, you come all the way to Hawaii to brag on your kids. No, I didn't come to Hawaii to brag on my kids. I came to tell you that there are moments where we have an opportunity to get our kids ready. Come on, look at somebody and say, get ready. Could God be positioning you? Could he be positioning you to step into a race to finish the prize? There's an interesting verse that I want to quickly show you, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And it's of a spiritual father speaking to his spiritual kids. And here's what he says. Paul says to his spiritual kids, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. I love how he starts and he says, listen, here's the thing. I'm going to get you in position to succeed. And one way is to be on guard. What's interesting is the word on guard, it's a, it's a very similar word that comes from a French phrase called on guard. How many here have ever been with your kids and you had a sword and you did this? On guard. Do you know that's a real thing? In France, when fencers would come and they'd be getting ready, it was very similar to what we see when they say, on your mark. They would say to the fencers, on guard. And what would they do? They would get in position. And here's what that French word literally means. It means used as a direct call to fencers to assume the prescribed position preparing for battle. Can I tell you, the Bible says that there is an enemy who wants to steal, he wants to kill, he wants to destroy. The devil doesn't want your kids to grow up and be who God called them to be. He doesn't want you to grow up and be who God wants you to be. He doesn't want you to fulfill your destiny, so he's coming after you. He wants to take you down, but I have good news. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And if you and I will take the lessons of spiritual encouragement from our Father in heaven, here's what he's saying to us. Here's what he's saying to you, Dad, if you feel like you're losing in the battle. Here's what he's saying, Dad, for you to do with your kids. Tell them, hung guard, get ready, because victory is coming, breakthrough is coming. If you'll stand in the calling, if you'll get in position to run the race. Come on, somebody say, get ready. Come on, I'm flashing back to, to T.D. Jakes. Somebody just say, get ready, get ready, get ready. It's an old sermon he used to preach, amen. 
Point number two, I think you know what it is. The first point is get ready. What's point number two? Set. Right, set. It's interesting, if you look, there's a, a picture right there of the blocks, the starting blocks. And when you look at runners, the second thing they do is, first of all, they get in position, and then secondly, once they're in position at the right place, they put their feet in, in these starting blocks, they get their, their hands right next to the line, they say, ready, and then they say, set. And as soon as they do, the booty goes up, the legs get ready, why? because they want to spring. It's called the, the four-point spring start position. And as I was thinking about that, I read a, a verse in Esther about the father, and it, it showed me something that I think is a great thing for us to all learn, whether you're a dad or not, because we're all going to be tested in this. It says in Esther chapter 3, verse 2, that Mordecai, he, he moved up in the ranks and started working in the um, official capacity at the palace and so on. It says this, all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. For, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servant who were with the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily and he would not listen to them. Mordecai had told them he was a Jew. See, there was this other guy by the name of Haman who kind of grew in power before the king. And so to honor them and to honor that person, the king said everybody needs to bow to Haman when he comes, just like if I came. But Mordecai, he wouldn't bow. Now, why did he do this? Is it just because he was stubborn? Is it because he didn't like him? No, the reason he didn't bow is because he was a righteous follower of his father in heaven, God. Because according to the Jewish custom and the Jewish law, if you bowed to anything other than God, it was idolatry. He was compromising his principles, his faith, if he bowed. He was backing away from what God expected from him. And the reason I bring that up when I read this story, the second principle I think that we all need to hear, but dads especially, is that Mordecai was a great leader, a great father to his family. Here's one of the reasons why. Because he wouldn't bow when pressure from the world came to get him to compromise. And dad, I'm here to tell you there are a lot of things in life that are going to try to get you to bow. But he would not bow. He was set. He was in place. He was ready for the race. He wasn't going to be pulled out of his lane. He wasn't going to be moved. There's an old song we used to sing in church that was a, in the, the red hymnals we used. And it went like this. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I sh Anybody know this old song? I shall not be. One person. Amen. It's a gr <laughs> we got a lot to learn. Amen. It was going to be a long sermon today. Um, <laughs> I shall not be, I shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. In other words, I am going to plant myself. I'm going to stand. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to let the world push and conform me. I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'm going to be set. Reminds me of uh, several years ago. How many, how many of you like think back to COVID and you're like, that's crazy. You know, anybody, when you think back to COVID, you kind of just go like this. You, you're like, you, you can't help it. You're like, it was just so weird and crazy. It was a crazy time. And, and I'm not here to make any kind of statements politically. But I will tell you that when COVID came in California, it was very restrictive. And they shut everything down and shut the churches down. And, you know, we tried to find the balance between honoring authority, but yet you know, doing what the scripture says and, and having the freedom to worship God. And so we, we, we did it. But there was one moment that came in, towards the, the end of that 2020 year. And here's kind of the story. Um, you know, at that time, there was a lot of things happening outdoors. They told us you could do things outdoors. You can, in California, they said you could have services outdoors, all of that stuff. There were things that were happening. And um, so I got a call from a ministry. His name was uh, Sean Foyt. And they were going to do a special event down in LA, but they basically shut it down. And so they said, could we come up to where you are because you have a big parking lot? Could we host the event? Here's what they were wanting to do. They were wanting to worship and pray the, 20, the year 2020 out and worship and pray the new year 2021 in. 
And so they call and ask, could we do it? And, and I didn't really think much about it at first because, again, it was okay to go out and, and you know, do other things. And so, um, I mean, restaurants are outside, and, and there was all kinds of stuff. So I prayed about it, thought about it, and I'm like, you know what? Um, they say, you know, it's okay to go outside. And so I feel like this is a God thing because we're going we're gonna to focus on Jesus. We're going to start the new year with vision and, and leaning into God. And so I said yes. And as soon as I said yes, and the word got out that I said yes, all hell broke loose. I started getting death threats. My kids started getting death threats. People started calling me a murderer because I was killing people. Now, granted, we're outside where people could social distance if they wanted to. They could wear a mask. We said, if you want to wear a mask, you wear a mask. But people, be, I had every television network, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, you name it, the, the New York Post, the San Francisco Chronicle, the LA Times, they all were coming at us. They were all challenging, and they were trying to get me to back down from what I felt like God had called us to do. Now, here's the crazy thing. In the middle of all of it, while they're trying to get us to not do it, I had COVID. And my wife had COVID. And it wasn't, it wasn't quick. It was 18 days of COVID. And my wife had it. And my kids were in quarantine. And part of my staff were in quarantine. And so I had a decision. Am I going to get out of my lane? Am I going to back down? Or am I going to be set and do what I feel God to call me to do? And so we said... We wrote a statement. I couldn't do interviews, but I couldn't tell them why I couldn't do interviews. Because <laughs> it would have made it worse. And so we did. 8,000 people showed up. And over 600 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ. <laughs> Outside. And all 600 of them got baptized. Come on, somebody shout amen. Dad. There's going to be pressure that's going to come. Well, all my buddies let their kids do whatever they want. Well, my buddies don't make their kids go to church. Well, it's okay to watch porn. Everybody else does. It's not just dads. It's everybody. The world is coming to try to get you to back down. But the question is, are you going to be set? Are you going to be solid? Are you going to stand true? I love what it says in 1 Corinthians. Again, Paul speaking to his spiritual kids. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one gets the prize? So run to win. All the athletes discipline in their training. They do it to win the prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I am disciplining my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear... After preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. You know, I was watching the, um, some of the uh, Olympic uh, meets that they had before these trials, and uh, there was a, a runner, his name is Gurley, and he was the fastest 100-meter sprinter in the world in 2022. And he got in, in position when they said, Mark, get your mark or get set, ready. And then he got into the blocks, and before the gun could sound... He took off, and as he started to go, his starting block slid because they didn't nail him in deep enough. So part of the problem was their fault, but part of the problem was he jumped the gun. And maybe you're here today, and you've been tempted to jump the gun. Maybe you're here today, and you've let some things slip. I want to tell you what a beautiful reminder that we have the opportunity to build our life not on sand but on the rock, Jesus Christ. That when the winds come and the storms come and the challenges and maybe even you feel like you've been disqualified, guess what? With God, you get a mulligan. Come on, do we have any golfers in the house? You get a second chance. There's a new chance with Jesus. He'll put you back in the blocks again. He'll put your feet on solid ground again where you can get up and you can run and you can fulfill. Here's the thing. God is the author and the finisher. He is the alpha. He is the omega. He is the completer of our faith. And the good work he started in you will be completed until the day of Jesus Christ. Somebody shout amen. amen. Point number one is what? Grace. Point number two is what? Yes. 
And I think you know what point number three is. You ready? What is it? Go. Go. I thought about bringing a starter's gun, but I knew that would be problems <laughs> when I got to the airport. Amen. I, I may not make it. Go. It's interesting because when you read this story, you kind of see the moment of go in a couple ways. Let me show you the first thing that really jumped out at me. It's found in Esther chapter 2, verse 11. And I love this about this father and his daughter. It says, and every day, everybody say every day. Every day, day, Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters. Let me pause here. What had happened is the king, his wife, he divorced her because she'd been very dishonoring. And so now he had to have a new queen. So he didn't know what to do, and so some guy who happened to be a movie producer, a television producer, came along and said, I got an idea. Why don't we do a show called The Bachelor? <laughs> and you bring in all of these young women and date them and then pick one, and then you can give her a rose. And so that's kind of how the story unfolded. And so Esther is selected to be one of the, the people in the show. And so he sits down with her, and, and he's preparing her. We already talked about that, right? Right? He prepared for what was coming. He talked to her. He said, hey, now remember, when you're in the interview room and the camera's on you, don't say crazy stuff. (laughs) And by the way, don't tell anybody that you're a Jew. He prepared her for what was to come. But not only that, I want you to see what he did. After she was in the show, every day Mordecai paced, which means to move towards. It means to go. That's what the Hebrew means, go. Go. Every day he would go in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Can I just tell you, I think a beautiful thing in this story is simply this for all the dads that are here, is that maybe God is saying in this season when the world is crazy and there's pressure like never before that you and I need to be proactive and start going, start moving closer towards our children. Just like the prodigal son had made some mistakes. And what did the dad do? He was waiting and he didn't stand back with judgment. He didn't stand back to say, I told you so. He moved. He, he was on the move. He ran toward and, and he, he embraced and he cared every single day he was on the move. I want to tell you, there's ways that you can move towards your children. One of the ways is get in their world. That's what Mordecai was doing. Be familiar with their lives. Can I say to the dads, but I'll say this to the moms. I'll say this to anybody that has people in your life that God wants you to be accountable for, have influence over. Do you know what's going on in their life? Do you know who their friends are? Do you know what kind of videos they watch? Do you know who they're texting? Do you you know the kind of influence that they're listening to on TikTok and and what's the influence in their life? I love this story because it was a father who said, I'm not going to stay at a distance, but I'm going to move closer to my children. And I want to encourage you, get closer to your kids. And you don't have to just do it by, you know, give me your phone. I'm talking about spend time with them, talk to them, encourage them. Maybe getting into their world is bringing them into your world. Making sure they're with you in church every week instead of, okay, you want to stay and go with your friends, go for it. No, bring them to church with you. Get them into the world with you that you're in, following Jesus, knowing him, serving him. One of the ways you can move towards your children is in prayer. You know, my father passed away a few years ago. He was a pastor for many years, and I still miss him. Father's Day is a tough day for me. But one of the things I love about my dad is he was a model, not just in being set and being a man of integrity and living what he preached, but he was a man who moved close to me. One of the ways he moved close to me was in affection. He did not grow up in an affectionate home. I remember him telling me before he died, I have video, in fact, I did a sermon one time called A Conversation with Dad. I did it on Father's Day. And I talked about conversations that David had with his son in the Bible, Solomon. But then I I showed video conversations I had with my dad before he passed away. And one of the things he told me is he said, Jared, I never remember my whole life one time my father telling me, I love you. And I'll never forget when we were young kids that, that you know, it'd be like something would happen we were going off to school. And, and my mom, because she grew up in a different type of situation, I remember she'd come and give me a hug and say, love you, have a great day. And, and dad, if he was home, she'd look at my dad and say, honey, hug your son. 
And he would do it. He'd come over and he'd give me the most awkward hug that the world has ever seen. <laughs> How many here, that's like awkward for you? Have you ever been in an awkward hug? You're like, do I, do I cut this off? Do I keep going? What do I do? This feels strange. It's like, should I just kiss him? Maybe it'll feel better. <laughs> it was the awkward. But he did it. He got out of his comfort zone. And he moved towards me. And you know what I remember now as a son when he died? I remember he always tugged me. And it wasn't weird at the end. Go. Don't stay where you are. One of the ways that he moved towards me with his prayer. I used to always grow up thinking that I lived in the home of Casper the ghost. Some of you are like, what are you talking about? Because my dad was an old Pentecostal. An old Pentecostal prayer warrior, and when he prayed, he prayed with a vibrato. If you don't know, if you're not a musician, vibrato is when you're singing a note and your voice goes like this. It's like, ah, oh, that's called a vibrato. My dad prayed with a vibrato. And in the morning, I would wake up literally out of sleep and I would hear, oh God, hallelujah. And I'd be like, whoa. He would pray for me every morning. In the morning, 6 a.m., he was up praying. And here's what I would hear him pray. Father, I declare that Jared will be strong in adversity and humble in success. And you know what happened is over the years, I heard him pray that prayer. And so when he died, I felt like God said, you need to take that and you need to move now towards your children. You need to help your children get moving in that direction. And so I developed a prayer and I've shared it with my church. And every morning I pray this over my children. I pray it over our staff. And here's what I say. I pray this prayer. What am I doing? I'm being like Mordecai. I'm getting out of my comfort zone and I'm moving towards my children spiritually. I'm moving. And here's what I say. Father, I declare in Jesus' name that they're going to be strong in adversity and they're going to be humble in this success like David. But God, I also thank you that they're going to grow in stature and in favor before God and before man like the prophet Samuel. Lord, I also thank you that, Lord, they're going to be blessed and you're going to expand their territories that they not cause pain like Jabez. And Lord, I also thank you that they're going to walk in a double portion of the anointing like Elisha received from Elijah. And Lord, I also thank you, God, that they're going to walk in wisdom far beyond their years like Solomon who received wisdom from heaven far beyond their training and far beyond their life experience. Oh, and God, I thank you that they're going to walk in the divine, perfect will of God, even if it requires a little bit of suffering, like Jesus when he said, not my will, but yours be done. Oh, and by the way, God, I thank you that you're Jehovah Rapha, so they're going to walk in health, divine health, and they're going to live long and declare the glory of the Lord. And all the way, by the way, God, I also thank you that you're going to bless my children with provision, because you are Jehovah Jireh, who provides all our needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Oh, and by the way, God, I thank you because they're on guard and no weapon formed against them will prosper. And every tongue that rises up will be condemned. This is the heritage of the saints of the Lord. I pray that every day over my children. Dad, you can move, you can go. You can launch towards your children. Why? So that they can win the race. They can receive their, I don't know about you, but man, I want my kids to get to heaven. I want God to stick a fork in them and say, well done. <laughs> Come on, somebody, amen. <laughs> Not medium rare. <laughs> well done, my good and faithful servant. Go. Let me give you the last go idea too. Sometimes as parents, it's not just us moving towards our kids, it's getting our kids to move towards their destiny and towards their God. I mean, sometimes we have to say, go. That's what happened with this story. If you read, let me, let me show you a really cool verse. So Haman, who becomes this leader, hates Mordecai and wants to kill all the Jews. So they pass a law. He gets the king to pass a law that on a certain day, everyone in the nation can attack the Jews and kill them and take their property. And so when Mordecai finds out, he basically goes to his daughter and he says, you gotta do something. Esther chapter four, verse 13. Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. 
For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go, gather all the Jews who are present in Sushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night, or three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. You see, in winter, and it says, it's time for you to grow up. It's time for you to be responsible. It's time for you to step into this moment that God has put you here for. And she's like, I'm too scared. I might die because if I go into the king's you know, presence and he doesn't raise that scepter, they'll kill me. I can be killed even as the queen. I don't know if I can do this, Dad. I don't know if, this is, I don't know if I'm able that, to do this. This is too hard. This is too difficult. But I love it that this dad didn't just kind of pamper, didn't just say, well, I love you. Do the best you can. Sometimes as Parents, we've got to push the bird out of the nest. Sometimes we've got to help them to, to move from where they are into the thing God has called them to be. And what happens? She steps up and she saves a nation because God had put her in this path for such a time as this. Dad, maybe the message this weekend for you is it's time to quit letting your kids live below their potential. Maybe it's, it's time for you to love them up. It's time for you to coach them up. It's time for you to quit saying, well, it's just too hard in the world we live in today. Maybe it's time to start turning on the jazz music and saying, I'm gonna take your phone. There's a, a video I wanna quickly show you as we come to an end. And I wanna set the video up because it, it's a powerful image of a father. And the person you're gonna see in this story is a man who is in the Olympics many years ago. Sorry, the video footage is terrible, and, but I just, I wanted you to see it. It was about a, a man who, um, he was running in a race. His name was Derek Redmond. And in the middle of the race, he pulls his hamstring. And like most people that would just quit and walk off, he decides he's gonna finish the race. And so he kind of is hobbling along and struggling and out of the stands runs his father. And you, you, I, I had to cut the video down, but what I love is that when the dad runs down there, he starts like carrying his son and his son breaks down and they hug and he basically runs with him and as he's running with him, all of the security runs and tries to take him off the, you know, off the track. And he's like shooing them away. He's like, this is my son, get out of here. And he car helps carry him to the end of the race. I want you to see this, Derek Redmond in the Olympics. Take a look. Tom Hammond and Craig Mass back, back at Olympic Stadium in Barcelona, coming up to the men's 400 meter semifinals. Here are the lane assignments. Steve Lewis in lane three. Top four to Wednesday's final. Steve Lewis in lane three. Roberto Hernandez out quickly in four. Now down the back stretch. Ismael on the left of the screen is running very, very quickly. And inside of Lewis, Sunday Bada of Nigeria. And Derek Redman of Great Britain has pulled up with an injury. Redman is out. Derek Redmond, the British record holder and an important member of that British 4x400 four meter relay team as he doesn't want anybody to help him. It'll be Lewis to win in 44.50. Look at this. He's going to try to finish his semifinal race. A bizarre finish to this first semifinal in the men's 400 meters. Derek Redmond of Great Britain pulled up with an injury halfway down the back stretch. He's fighting off those trying to help him to finish the race in his lane. And now the pain too much.
that is the Olympic spirit. It shows him walk across the finish line with his dad. Today, I want to say, first of all, to every dad who at moments in your life said, I'm not going to let my child keep running alone. And you got out of the seats and you ran and you grabbed their hand or you picked them up or you spoke a word of encouragement or you just were there when everybody else left. Thank you. Happy Father's Day. But maybe today the job's not done. I figured that out. I've got grandkids. My kids are adults. And I realize my job's not done. Don't give up on the call that God has for you. The second thing I want to say is that maybe you're here today and you feel like you're Matt Redman. Derek Redman, actually, not Matt Redman. We'll make sure we get the right person. And maybe you pulled a hamstring and you've been struggling. I want you to know something. You may not know it, but God has already jumped out of the stands and he's headed your way. Your father in heaven loves you and he will not leave you. What does the Bible say? He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. And today he's there to put his arms around you. He's there to lift you up. He's there to let you pour out your heart and your disappointments and he's there to help carry you through to the finish line he is the alpha he is the omega he is the beginning he is the end the bible says he is the completion or the finisher of our faith he will carry you to the end but here's the thing don't run from him don't give up but surrender and let your father in heaven embrace you just like the prodigal son's father he came and what did he do he put his arms around his son he put shoes on his feet. He put a ring on his finger. He put a robe. I wish I could preach to you on all the, all the significance of those things. But he empowered his son to continue forward. God loves you. He left the stands for you. And here's how he did it. He sent his only son who died on a cross so he could feel what it's like to walk in this world. He could feel what it's like to face adversity. I said it at the beginning and I'll say it now. Your father, whether you're a dad or not, your father gets you. He's not forgotten you. I want you to close your eyes all across this auditorium, those that are joining us online. Maybe you're here today and you didn't know that you're in a race and you realize the end of the race is when you close your eyes and take your last breath and you step into eternity. And if you win the prize, you get to spend eternity with your Father in heaven, who, by the way, is preparing a place for you called heaven. And if you want to win the prize, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to know things are right between you and God, let me just tell you something. You're not going to finish the race and get to heaven and win by, by doing what the world says, which is, well, I'll just be a good person, or I'll do my best. I'll just tough it out. There's only one way to get there, and his name is Jesus. He died on a cross for you. And the Bible says, because here's the thing, we all sin. If you're here, you've made mistakes just like I have. No one's perfect. But the Bible says if we'll have the courage to admit our imperfection, admit our, our pulled hamstrings, admit our challenges, confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. So here's what we're going to do today. And the Bible says if we'll confess with our mouth and believe in Jesus. So if we'll confess our sin and believe or call on Jesus, we're going to get to that finish line going to celebrate eternity with our Father in heaven. So if you want to go to heaven, if you want to finish the race and win the prize, when I count to three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Now, I might be talking to someone who's never raised their hand, but I might be talking to someone who in a service might have prayed a prayer or lifted their hand, but you're like the prodigal son and you've run off kind of doing your own thing and say, no, I got this. Wouldn't it be crazy if I was hanging off a cliff because I decided to go hiking here on Oahu and, and I stumbled and was hanging on the cliff there about to fall and die and you came along and reached down and said, hey, hey, Jared, grab my hand. And if I looked at you and I said, no, I'm good, I got this, you'd think I was crazy. And what's amazing to me as a pastor is every week people walk out of church, God has his hand extended and says, I want to save you. And people go, I'm good, I got this. Don't walk out today. He came to save you. So maybe you need to get back on track because you're a prodigal, or maybe you're making the first time decision. When I say three, I want you to lift your hand high and then we're gonna all pray a prayer on this Father's Day weekend. You ready? 
One, you can be forgiven. Two, you can finish the race and win the prize. When I say three right now, where are you? Three, come on, lift your hands right now, all over this room. Who is God talking to today? Lift them high. Thank you. Who else today? Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you. Anybody else today? Say yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody else today? Thank you, 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 thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. You can put your hands down. Now pray this prayer with me all out loud. Say, Jesus, today, on this weekend, on Father's Day, I acknowledge I've made mistakes, I've sinned, and I need a Savior. Come into my life, cleanse me, change me, forgive me. I put my faith in you as a son of God and Savior of the world, starting today, in Jesus' name. Now I wanna do this. If you made that decision, they're gonna give you some instructions, but I want everyone to stretch your hands towards heaven, everyone in the room. Why are we doing this? Because Paul said, I wish, in the Bible, it says, I wish everyone everywhere would lift their hands in prayer. So I want to encourage you to do it. Here's what I want to do. I want to pray over you. Father, for every dad, I thank you that you're giving them a new vigor, a new power, a new anointing for the next season. Lord, whether it's taking care of their kids or providing for their family or dealing with an issue on the job or the business that they have, you're going to empower them for what they're called to do. Kingdom men are going to rise up and inspire church like never before in the name of Jesus. Lord, for the, for the ones, and maybe they're not a dad, maybe they're a mom, or maybe they're a coach or a mentor, and they're struggling because they have some people in their life and they don't know what to do or how to handle it. Father, I thank you that you're going to give them wisdom far beyond even their own um, knowledge and experience. God, you said if we lack wisdom, ask of God and you'll give it liberally. I thank you that you're releasing wisdom. I thank you for blessing on every family. I thank you blessing on every child. I thank you blessing on every father. And I thank you, Lord, that today is going to be a day of new beginnings. And we're going to get ready. Lord, maybe we've been fighting it and it's time to get on mark, to get set, and to go. The last thing I'm going to pray over you is this. There's people that are here today and joining us online, and the devil has been working overtime on you all morning because he's been telling you, you know what, all that stuff he's saying, it doesn't matter for you because you know what happened in your life, and you're going to repeat all the bad stuff that, that was put on you. You're going to pass it on down. Here's the word from the Lord. God is breaking generational curses this morning, and you are not going to, you are not going to pass on the unhealth that was on you because of Jesus every curse is broken a new beginning a new chapter in Jesus name and everybody said God bless you happy Father's Day Inspire Church Amen